Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Soper. I work at the Jackson Laboratory as the manager of the Technical Information Services Group. Joining me today is Dr. Kat Lutz. She is the Senior Director for the Mouse Repository and the In Vivo Pharmacology Group at the Jackson Laboratory. Also joining us today is Dr. Ximing Wang. He is joining us today from China. Uh, he is part of the Technical Information Services Group over there in China. And uh, just so everyone knows, we are live streaming today. So uh, we may find times when the internet kind of slows down a little bit and we get some audio interruptions. So just bear with us with that. Uh, I think you're all probably used to that if you're working from home and trying to do things uh, in these group meetings. So uh, we experience the same thing as everyone else does. Uh, uh, Ximing, if you could for a moment tell us a little bit about how things are going in China. Uh, I know it's been pretty difficult over the last few months, and uh, now it's beginning to be difficult here in the United States. So it'd be interesting to hear what uh, your current perspective is on this whole thing. Sure, Brian. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the introduction and the opportunity to connect. Uh, I'm currently in my hometown, Wuhan, uh, where the virus was first detected in December last year. So it has been more than two months. The city is under complete lockdown. It was very difficult during the first couple of weeks, but with the uh, impose of series of strict policies and medical staff and supplies from all over the country flock into the city, the outbreak is under control. And the good news is that the restriction will be lifted in two days. Right. Well, I'm glad things are progressing there. I think we've got a little bit of ways to go here. All right, well, thank you. Um, so the main topic today is going to be a mouse that's being distributed from the Jackson Laboratory very, very soon. Uh, as you know, uh, the mission of the Jackson Laboratory is to help researchers uh, with cutting edge models and services to advance your research and as part of our shared quest to improve human health. So in that spirit, we have obtained this mouse called the Humanized ACE2 mouse. And uh, we're gonna talk about that mouse today and when it hopefully will be available. You know, it's mouse biology, so things can vary a little bit and we'll talk about that. Uh, one really quick distinction I wanna make, uh, there are two different ways that people think about humanized mice. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each one. Uh, the primary focus is this mouse is expressing a human protein. So it's been genetically engineered to be expressing the human form of a protein. So that's one form of humanization. The second form of humanization we'll briefly touch on today as well is immunodeficient mice that have been transplanted with human cells and tissues, namely the mice that are transplanted with cord blood derived CD34 hematopoietic stem cells, for example, and that's another form of humanization. Okay, so we're gonna get started in a second, but before I do that, I wanna mention that uh, whatever platform you're on, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter, there should be a portion of your platform that allows you to type in questions. Feel free to type those questions in that should show up on our feed and we will try to answer those. Uh, maybe one or two as we go along if they're pertinent and then but particularly at the end we're going to have a little q a session so if you have some questions for us uh, we'll do our best to try to answer those okay so let's go on to our first question today uh, the first one is let's start out by bringing our audience up to speed uh, what exactly is this human ace2 mouse model and why is it so important so the humanized S2 mouse is a transgenic mouse model expressing human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, S2 gene. And the protein it calls for is the receptor that SARS-CoV-2 used to enter the human body. And the traditionally mouse model has been widely used to test drugs and vaccines and also to investigate the nature of infection. However, because there is a structural difference between human and the mouse S2, coronavirus itself is poor at infecting mice. But transgenic expression of the ACE2 protein of human origin allowed the common laboratory mouse to become susceptible to the coronavirus. And ACE2 is exactly the same receptor, SARS-CoV, 
the original virus caused that used to infect cells. So the transgenic model created years ago for the SARS research could be used for the COVID-19 research. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we did have a, a one question that came in. Someone was asking for some little bit of clarity. Uh, there's a little bit of nomenclature that's being tossed out in the media just to make sure everyone understands the difference. Uh, there are three things. There's the original uh, coronavirus that was the SARS virus, which was just mentioned by Shimeng. That's the SARS-CoV. This new virus is also a coronavirus, and it has a nomenclature SARS-CoV-2. So this is a new virus. So that's the virus. And then you've also seen in the uh, 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 common streams from the news media, COVID-19. So COVID-19 refers to the disease that develops after you become infected. So that's just so people understand the difference there. Okay, so the next question I'd like to ask is, what strategies are being developed by JAX to get this new mouse model out to the scientific community as quickly as we possibly can? I can help answer that question for you, Brian. Um, certainly, the, the mouse model was, was developed uh, by Stanley Perlman back in 2007, and it was used primarily to study SARS, as Chiming uh, had mentioned. So while this mouse was very useful and is still very useful for us today, um, it hadn't been actively breeding in a large uh, capacity that you would normally see in a distribution colony, either in a repository or a commercial vendor. So we were very fortunate that uh, Dr. Perlman gave us um, some of the vials of sperm that he had tucked away in his, in his private stash. And we used these uh, vials of sperm to conduct in vitro fertilizations. And in doing so, we were able to superovulate uh, black six female mice and then do the in vitro fertilization uh, using these vials of sperm that Dr. Coleman provided for us. And that allowed us to get a very large base colony um, up and going at this point. I think it's important to mention that um, we're not necessarily expanding this colony as you would normally think so uh, with traditional breeding where you put, you know, four mice together and, you know, get, get maybe 20 uh, as a result of that. We really are taking um, uh, the use of in vitro fertilization and taking advantage of this to go from just a few vials of sperm to large numbers of animals. And in doing so, we're hoping that we can provide these animals to the scientific community, not only uh, more quickly, but in large enough numbers that makes their research meaningful um, as they start to test vaccines and, and antivirals. Wow, that, that, that's fantastic that we can deploy uh, these really innovative technologies to do this and get this up quite quickly. That's pretty amazing. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, how can this model help with vaccine and therapy development? And a little bit more detail about how that model could, could be used and why we think it's important. Okay, I, I can start, Brian. Uh, so the first step for drug approval process typically involves testing efficacy in animal models. And most of the time in mice, but having a mouse model, the step go to infection is critical really to set the foundation. This allows you to test the effectiveness of vaccine or antibody-based treatment in terms of reducing viral load and its associated symptoms. And uh, you may want add something to that. Yeah, just to maybe speak a little bit to the antivirals, um, certainly uh, over, over the last decade or more, the use of broad spectrum antivirals um, in a number of different diseases, you know, has really ramped up uh, the research in, in the scientific community. And so while we don't necessarily have an antiviral specifically for um, COVID-19 at this point, I think that we do have, uh, we as in the scientific community, have an arsenal of broad spectrum antivirals that could be very effective um, in, in this particular disease. 
And the way that the mouse models will be used um, are to then uh, have the mice infected with COVID-19. And in this case, you know, see how, how efficiently these uh, antivirals can, can clear uh, the, the viral load uh, in, in these animals. And so again, this is uh, one of the reasons why at the Jackson Laboratory, we're working so hard to generate the, the numbers of animals as quickly as we can to, to really get through not only the antivirals that are out there already, um, but other FDA approved drugs, you know, that can help uh, possibly in the fight of this disease. Yeah, I would think there's uh, quite a bit about the overall biology of this virus compared to some of these others as well. I mean, these this seems to be particularly bad in terms of its virulence once it's infected and mm -hmm. hopefully trying to understand why it's so different and how to intervene in that would be critically important. Right. Okay. Um, the other question that might be popping up from folks around the world is, uh, what about some of the other mouse models that are available and uh, what might be more advantages to this one? We know that there are uh, a few other models that have been developed. Maybe, Shimin, you could touch on that? Yeah, sure. Um, besides uh, what Kat just mentioned, Dr. Perman's human is too much Jack is distributing. There are at least three other published mouse models, uh, human is to mouse transgenic models that I'm aware of. And all of them differ slightly, slightly in terms of the promoter that drives expression, the genetic background of the mice, the copy number of the uh, transgene being inserted, and the very likely different insertion site. And all of this could have an impact on the X2 expression and therefore the tissue distribution and the phenotype of the mice have been infected. Um, most of the other models that I just talked about are in private labs and including one group in China. And there are several mouse model providers in China in the process of generating the human S2 models as a model generation service, but mostly for the Chinese research community, as far as I know. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll add to that a, a little bit um, because certainly the, the mouse models that we have, uh, the one that we have at the Jackson Laboratory now with the humanized ACE2, um, we think that this is going to be very effective um, in, in sort of that first pass biology of trying to understand the anti antivirals and, and also for the vaccine research. I also think there are always going to be other questions that the scientific community wants to interrogate. Um, some of those being around maybe individual susceptibility. We certainly um, have seen that within the population uh, from, a, from, the, from the standpoint of a population of genetics. You know, who are the individuals who are possibly more susceptible or more resistant to COVID-19? And that goes beyond, I think, uh, just some of the comorbidities that, that are, are there in some of the aging population susceptibilities like um, uh, hypertension and, and type 1 diabetes certainly will, will, will give you more susceptibility. But we're also curious as to whether or not there are other um, levels of disease susceptibility and resistance that could lie within the, the genetics of an individual. Mm -hmm. And so if we can identify some of those susceptibility and resistance factors within the population, those themselves may may lead us to different drug targets uh, that we can interrogate for for other uh, therapeutic targets. I'll also say that um, there's never really any one mouse model that really serves to to answer all the questions of the scientific community. Um, and I think we're also starting to think a little bit more now about how we can manipulate the current mouse genome so that it may uh, give us possibly a less severe infection uh, than what we have for the for the humanized mouse to the humanized ace 2 that we currently have in hand so there's a lot of really um, very bright individuals out there who are thinking about not only how we genetically engineer new models um, but then how we also interrogate overall underlying genetic susceptibility and resistance within the population yeah, yeah. This genetic diversity question is obviously critically important. I mean, there's it people is. out there that 
are carrying the virus and are not developing symptoms. And so they're having a much better immune response. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really got to be something to do with uh, the genetics and what proteins are being recognized and not recognized and overall response and getting some detailed answers to that would be very, very helpful. Yeah, it really is fascinating when these numbers, you know, start to come out, the number of people who have been infected with the virus who have been completely asymptomatic uh, during during the infectious period. I think that there's a lot of really interesting biology to learn from that. Mm -hmm. And if you think about mouse models that we have, uh, we also have reference populations, if you will, within mice. And so not every mouse is, is, uh, is the same with respect to its genetic background and makeup. Um, so interrogating those questions using those mouse models and those different strains that we have can, can really give us uh, not just a mouse model that's infected with, with, uh, with the coronavirus, but um, also different populations who may have varying degrees of susceptibility and resistance, which could, again, be a, be a big game changer down the road. Okay, so one other question uh, that has come in actually to my group, the Technical Information Services Group, uh, people have been interested in this, and that is uh, the other form of humanization. Uh, the Jackson Laboratory distributes immunodeficient mice that have been transplanted with cord blood derived hematopoietic stem cells. And the purpose of this is to establish a human immune system in the mouse. Uh, and so people have been interested. Well, if they're expressing human cells uh, in the mouse and they're circulating in the blood of these mice, uh, they may be expressing proteins that would be like ACE2 uh, where the virus could bind. So the question is, can those mice uh, become infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, obviously we haven't tested that yet and we don't know exactly, but maybe Shimin could uh, elaborate on that question a little bit more for us. Yeah, sure. Um, Brian, I think this is a very interesting question. And uh, ACE2 distribution has been extensively studied in human. And so ACE2 expressing a variety of human tissues in addition to lungs. And blood has the lowest ACE2 expression level. And uh, small intestine is actually the tissue that has the highest expression. And so it is technically possible for the mice to be infected. However, there's no evidence that Road can be detected in the blood in human patients. Given its minimal is to express an immune cell and also check very strict handling conditions. So the chances of uh, humanized mouse to be infected is extremely slim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. And Kat, uh, if you want to add something to the operation side to this question. Sure. I mean, I think we, we, we have thought a lot about um, the, the different scenarios that we would see um, in a mouse production facility and trying to learn. Um, we're taking some of the learnings that we have, you know, so for example, do, do um, mice that are, that are older, you know, have more susceptibility? And we just don't know the answer to that question at this point. But as you mentioned, the, the receptor in, in mouse is, is different enough uh, from the humans that we don't necessarily believe um, that you'll see any significant infection in the average laboratory mouse. For the mouse models that we have carrying the, the humanized ACE2, um, certainly those animals are breeding in very high barrier, maximum barrier facilities. Um, all of our personnel are um, equipped with PPE. Um, they are in uh, helmets and protective clothing and all of the mice are being uh, taken care of uh, under underneath hoods and have no uh, exposure to, to the normal environment. And these are the everyday precautions that we take with all of our mice at the Jackson Laboratory because we're really trying hard uh, to make sure and have had a fantastic track record in this to make sure that the, the mice that we distribute to the scientific community are not in any way, shape or form um, 
exposed to any uh, pathogens or opportunistics or even any commensal uh, bacteria or organisms that we would not want uh, to have in, in our animals. So those precautions in and of themselves are, are sufficient in working with the humanized uh, transgenic models that we have. And I should also say too that there are um, uh, uh, tests that we can do um, to detect any kind of virus in our mouse colonies. And as you can imagine, um, we, we certainly don't, uh, don't anticipate having any of those. Uh, but, but also to note that the, the pathogenesis um, in this humanized mouse model is very quick. Um, so when you are in a BSL-3 facility, which is where we imagine most people will be utilizing these mice, um, those are those are the environments that really protect um, people, uh, and those are the environments where the infectivity will will normally be occurring. So the mice that we have at the Jackson Laboratory are not infected, um, and we're taking every precaution to make sure that they wouldn't be. Um, and as I mentioned, we have no reason to believe that that's at all um, a risk. However, you know the proper testing of our animals, you know, can be employed. So so again, I think that the the, that these mice are going to be really quite useful um, in facilities that allow for BSL-3 type of work and the mm -hmm. testing for infectivity, looking for vaccine and antivirals and other therapeutics that we can test. And I think it's important to note in a controlled manner, uh, you know, some of the work that's going on right now within the, within the population of patients that we have is very difficult to sometimes control, you know, what is the proper dose um, and what are the, the, the treated versus the non-treated. And so, you know, we're really hoping that these mice will be incredibly useful um, in informing the, the treatments that we can possibly give to, to patients in the very near future. Great. Uh, Jiming, any other kind of uh, summarization that you would like to add to this to really kind of make sure people have some take home messages from this conversation? Uh. Actually, I do not. I think okay, it's been pretty well from operation side to the humanized phase two, and then from uh, biological, just the uh, immune cell expression of phase two protein. Yeah, uh, I think I'll just add that you know this team has made a heroic effort. This team, meaning the Jackson Laboratory folks. Uh, to really bring this mouse really from the freezer and out onto the shelf and into a production environment very, very quickly. Um, if you are interested in obtaining these mice, we do have a web page up uh, that you can log interest. Uh, we're trying to understand how many people want these mice and uh, you can get in touch with us there and log your interest. Uh, we're trying to get these mice out to as many people as we can as quickly as possible. Uh, I don't know, Kat, you have any other comments you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the only thing that I'll answer or, or add to that, Brian, is that because of the nature and how we're expanding these colonies through IVF, um, you know, the, the, the gestation and the wean time for, for a mouse is, is somewhere between eight and 10 weeks when you factor in the reproductive maturity of them. And so while we don't have mice that we're distributing today, um, in a very short period of time, um, we're gonna have gone from um, zero to 100 miles an hour relatively quickly. So we are encouraging individuals to put orders in for what they think that they are going to need um, we will likely be distributing these animals in quantities far faster than, than you can breed them, um, <laughs> given our current, current structure and the way we've um, structured these IVFs. I think that um, we will very quickly go from, um, from, from just having a, a couple of mice to, to, to really satisfying the, the needs of the greater community. And, and we're hoping to do that within the next um, eight weeks. And so, Currently, we have um, somewhere around the mid, uh, middle of June uh, as our distribution time, but a lot of the work that we've been doing so far is really favorable, and we're hoping um, that we can, again, really put all of the mice that are needed in the hands of the people who need them to help us get through this crisis. Great. Thank you. 
I do have a question from someone uh, in our audience. Uh, uh, they're saying, it is great work you people of JAX are doing. What about the influence of transport of human ACE2 transgenic mice from JAX to respective labs on exposure to pathogens and other environmental conditions? So, so I'm sorry, Brian. I, I had a little trouble hearing you on that one. Could you just repeat the question really briefly? Certainly. Yeah, it says... Uh, what about the influence of transport of these uh, transgenic mice from JAX to the respective labs uh, with regard to exposure to pathogens, environmental conditions, and things like that? Yeah, I can, I can help to answer that a, a little bit. So all of our animal, uh, whether they're the humanized ACE2 or, or any model from the Jackson Laboratory, is, is transported in a very controlled environment. The, the boxes that we use for transport not only have um, all the nutrition and food and water that the animals need, they're also in a very controlled environment uh, with special filters uh, that, have in, that are placed in the containers so that no pathogens are able to get in or out. The instructions for opening those boxes are, are very specific and the Transportation that we have is dedicated uh, transportation with environmental controls. And so the idea that the animals are, are very, very clean when they leave our facility will be as clean um, as you get them when you receive them in your facility. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, the I think folks need to remember that, you know, there are a lot of other viruses out there in the world. There's a lot of other viruses that veterinary staff at uh, research institutions don't mm -hmm. want the mice to have uh, that are not infectious for people, but are infectious for mice. So these mm -hmm. barriers that uh, Kat are talking about are gonna be the same barriers that should be effective for coronavirus. Uh, so these mice are protected and uh, they will get to your facility. Uh, another couple of questions I have here. Uh, maybe Shiming, you can answer this one. Is the insertion site of the transgene known? And will investigators be permitted to move the allele to other backgrounds? For research? Okay, I can I can try to answer the first the first question. Uh, so, is the trans, is the insertion site of the transgene known? The answer is no from the original paper. But I think Cat Group is actively uh, pursuing this direction to figure out where this question has been landed. And uh, Kat, do you want to ex uh, expand the, the an answer and also try to, uh, to answer the latter question? Are, are, they, are investigators permitted to move a little to the background or maybe cross to another strain? Yeah, so so the animals um, that we have, uh, as Chiming has has referenced, we, we still do not know what the insertion site is, and we're actively working on that. Um, and as soon as we know, we'll make that information available to the scientific community, as long uh, as, as well as be providing a very high dense um, SNP analysis to, to make sure that we're understanding the genetic background as well. And oftentimes, when the density of that panel is high enough, it kind of reveals at least the chromosome location of where that transgene may have landed, uh, depending on which allele it was integrated in from the beginning. With respect to moving the, the gene to different backgrounds, um, yes, that is allowed. Um, uh, the, the conditions of use for research um, you know, state that you can utilize this mouse for, for any research purpose that you need to. You can cross it to different strains um, there are some, you know, restrictions from a commercial standpoint and then what you can do with that because we certainly want to be respectful of the University of Iowa who had donated those mice. But for individual research uses, yes, you can um, definitely manipulate through genetic crosses and genetic backgrounds that animal model. And many people, um, as you can imagine, are currently doing that um, as we speak. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Another question we had here is, um, will the Jackson Laboratory conduct COVID-19 research in its own facility? Um, basically, the bottom line for that one is, is uh, 
The Jackson Laboratory does not have the biosafety facilities that are necessary for doing that type of work. As you can imagine, as we mentioned a few moments ago, we would need to do biosafety level three type of work. Those are very specialized facilities for doing that kind of research. Uh, we don't have those capabilities at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, remember, uh, we have, uh, boy, well over 11,000 different strains here at the Jackson Laboratory. Obviously, not all of them are alive on the shelf, but we have a huge number of strains, and we need to be very, very careful about uh, doing infectious disease at the Jackson Laboratory just from the basis of not wanting any kind of risk in terms of any kind of spread of any kind of virus whatsoever. Uh, and we re-derive everything in as we import it, those kinds of things. So that's not something that uh, we're going to uh, undertake at this time. I don't know if uh, panelists have anything to add to that. I think that's very true, Brian. I, I think that our ability to 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 work directly with infectivity uh, using the virus is, as you said, um, not something that we're going to do on site at the Jackson Laboratory. We don't have those uh, biosafety level uh, facilities, but certainly there are a number of organizations uh, across the world who do, and we're really hoping that that they engage in as much research um, and investigation with this virus uh, as as they are as their capacity allows okay. all right well thank you very much both of you uh this has been really helpful um i'm afraid we're out of time now uh and we don't have any more questions coming in uh but if you do think of questions you would like to ask maybe after this is over you can reach out to the Technical Information Services Group at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, you can email us at micetech at jacks.org uh, about this model or any of the other models that are in our collection. Uh, we'd be happy to speak with you. Uh, if it's something that my group isn't prepared to answer, we have access to experts like uh, Kat and others around the Jackson Laboratory who are performing research in a wide range of mouse models of human disease, and we'll try to get those uh, questions answered for you. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, wherever you are in the world. Uh, please be careful. Please be safe. Watch out for your loved ones, and we hope to talk to you again sometime very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brian.